As Pahlavan mentioned, there is um, three speakers. Uh, uh, we are missing one speaker, Jerry Flynn from Verizon Wireless. He actually had a last minute uh, on uh, Friday. He's told that he needed to be somewhere uh, with the corporation so he could make it. So the first speaker would be Kirk Burrows from Qualcomm. And the title of the presentation is Discussion of Indoor Location Standard. Kirk? You can just introduce yourself. Okay. Hello, my name is Kirk Burrows and I work for Qualcomm. I've uh, been there, I think, uh, a little over 10 years now. I came from uh, the SnapTrack uh, startup that Qualcomm bought. Um, SnapTrack was, of course, uh, one of the founders of Sista GPS and um, uh, speaking of the government earlier, right, is the, the FCC mandate for 911 and cell phones was kind of the catalyst for that technology, and it's now pretty much ubiquitous in the U.S. and in, uh, in phones, and, and now, of course, the uh, push is to take uh, that type of technology to uh, indoors. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the past and the present and the future of location standards with an emphasis on uh, indoor location standards. Um, so what I have uh, on the first couple slides is just kind of a an overview of various standards bodies and uh, some of the highlights of the things that they're working on. A um, uh, little bit of history on the outdoors, I said, and then rolling into uh, indoor technology. Uh, and then there's some subsequent slides going into a little more detail on uh, a few specific standards bodies, not all of them. So we, the core one, the main one, is 3GPP and 3GPP2. These are the uh, long-standing traditional cellular um, standards bodies where GSM, like Ben CDMA, CDMA and LTE carriers have uh, standardized uh, everything in terms of uh, how cellular technology works and particular location-based services and E911. As I said, E911 is where a lot of this started in terms of uh, my career and, you know, getting location um, uh, into the cellular industry. So. You'll hear a lot about indoor technology and, and the need for uh, new technologies to get it work, and that's somewhat, um, you know, an inaccurate statement because uh, the existing technologies today, AGPS, and as mentioned earlier today, AFLT, and the soon-to-be-deployed LTE observed time difference arrival actually do work indoors. So if you dial 911 from your cell phone right now, you're going to get a position estimate based on either the satellite or the terrestrial or some combination of the two ranging, and that's how the um, um, public safety is actually going to, you know, come get you. Now, obviously, as you get indoors, it's 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 not as good. They wouldn't know you're on the sl second floor. They probably would just know that you're on the city block. So, you know, it can certainly uh, uh, improve, but it, it, ba it basically uh, does work indoors. Um, uh, OTDOA should be better than AFLT. It was designed to be better than AFLT, so hopefully see some improvements there. Um, there's GPS out there today. There's GLONASS. Uh, pretty soon there'll be Compass, we hope. Uh, we're still waiting for the uh, ICDs from the uh, Chinese government. Um, but when that happens, there'll be standards activities there. Um, but still, there are limits to the level of accuracy you're going to get. Uh, 3GBP and 3GBP2, in my opinion, have missed an opportunity to uh, be more proactive on some areas to do better on indoor standardization for location. Uh, they have deployed and are standardized femtocells. Uh, that's an important part for carriers. They want to have indoor coverage to, you know, churn is one of the biggest issues for carriers and coverage is one of the biggest reasons for churn. So they'll put a femtocell in, in somebody's house. Um, the, the carrier solved 911 on a femtocell uh, by cheating a little bit and basically just given the position of the femtocell, either provisioned or uh, the GPS fix of the femtocell, assuming a, a residential uh, deployment. Uh, but there's nothing in the standards that allow that to be fully leveraged into a more broader uh, positioning technology for generic location-based services on the indoors. Additionally, there's a, a lot of work with wireless LAN interworking so that um, uh, uh, IP services can transition from wireless WAN to wireless LAN, um, both just for necessity and also now uh, with some sense of urgency for data offloading. Uh, but all the activity in 3GBP and 3GBP2 is not really discussing the implications of location-based technology. And I think, you know, it's kind of a um, um, uh, 
it's an area where the main companies in 3GPB and 3GB2 could probably be more aggressive because one of the main themes of my talk is that there's not a cohesive strategy for location-based uh, standardization on, on the indoor front. Um, OMA, uh, OMA basically created an IP version or what we call a user plane version of the location-based uh, standards that were defined by 3GPP and 3GBP2. Uh, and uh, they exist, you know, the borderline ubiquitous actually in, um, uh, around the world, especially SUPL 1.0 for the GSM and wideband CDMA carriers. Uh, and SUPL 2 will be ubiquitous for all the carriers because it's uh, what enables, um, uh, L it's, it uses LTE. Um, but it's just a equivalent to what 3GP and 3GBP2 did. So it gives you AGNSS, AFLT, OTDOA type positioning technologies. Uh, but OMA has gone one step further, and they're working on SUPL 3.0 and LPP 1.0. Uh, and these two standards collectively give a great framework for uh, indoor location standards. So I'm going to expand a little bit on that in my presentation, because I think that's the most uh, interesting area for uh, the folks in this uh, room to uh, uh, spend some cycles. Um, and I'll go into some of the other activities. IEEE is actually an interesting one. If you look at 802.11v or 802.11u, these are actually very, very old standards, and they're just gathering dust, and there's no commercial implementations of them. Um, but 802.11v uh, allowed for um, the access point to extract RSSI and RTT measurements from a Wi-Fi chipset. And you know, then you could then calculate a position estimate of, of, uh, of the mobile, um, and and it was bidirectional, and you know, it's a very um, powerful standard in terms of what's in it. But it's you know, wireless LAN specific, and it's you know, at the layer two layer, um, so it's not doesn't have a framework, doesn't have a complete solution. And you'll see that many other standards have actually stole from 802.11b the actual measurements. Um, I, IETF did it. Let's so look at some of the IETF standards that are out there today um, for now at the IP layer. So going up from L2 to the IP layer, moving these 802V measurements back and forth, um, but in an IETF framework. And uh, you'll see later that OMA uh, has done the same thing. IETF's also done some um, uh, def, uh, different addresses or different formats for the position location, like civic addresses, right? Uh, the 3GBP and 3GBP2 are X and Y, arguably Z as well, but you know, 911 and most services are just focused on X and Y. Um, IETF introduced a civic address, um, uh, indoor positioning, uh, uh, relative positioning, so an X, Y, Z coordinate system off of a, uh, you know, one corner of the building. Um, so those are important pieces of uh, the indoor location standards, but not, not a whole framework. Some other areas where there's work going on, the FCC, it's not a standards body, uh, of course, but it's um, influential and uh, you know, results in um, uh, solutions being defined. Um, the 50 meter accuracy for outdoor positions been around forever. That's what 3GBP and 3GBP2 is uh, uh, strive to solve. Um, but uh, there is a working group that the FCC has just um, sanctioned called CISRIC. I can't remember what the acronym stands for, security and reliability something. Uh, this is the third time this group's come together. Uh, and in, in the, a sub-working group of it, working group three, just uh, by coincidence, the name, um, they're working on several things. Um, uh, and the one that's relevant to today's topic is the indoor location. Um, so they're trying to figure out what um, should the FCC mandate or what should the FCC consider in terms of indoor uh, 911 services or in, uh, the, how does 911 work indoors. And just to show you how complex everything is, one of the very first tasks that they have to do and they're not making very much progress on is what's the definition of indoors? And does it have to have four walls? Does it have to have a ceiling, right? Um, um, so uh, I don't think CISRIC is gonna come to any grand conclusions in terms of uh, specifying a mandate for uh, indoor uh, 911 in the short time frame, but that's a good thing because I don't think the industry is ready for it. Uh, so they will, I think, uh, define some common terms, uh, set some um, criteria for how you could define indoor, how you could test uh, indoor, and how you could evaluate the technologies. Uh, and one of the things they are starting to look at is, 
is uh, how to leverage the existing LBS uh, services that exist today. You know, indoor technology obviously works. We started today with a, a Google um, uh, Maps demo going into an IKEA store. So clearly there is some technology out there that works, but you know, is it reliable enough for 911? It works in IKEA, but it doesn't work in the Walmart store right next to it. And if 911's wrong, you know, that can be a problem. Liability issues in the whole nine yards. So, uh, but I think the FCC wants to figure out a way of leveraging the commercial deployments and the commercial success, either, you know, in friendly fashion or non-friendly fashion. This is something we'll have to deal with in terms of how the FCC gets involved. Um, TTA is the uh, Korean standards body, so it's the equivalent to like Etsy in Europe um, or TIA over here in America. And this is an interesting um, uh, group because they are actually defining what is, in my mind, a pretty complete indoor location solution based on wireless LAN. They have a standard like 802.11b um, that allows access points and Wi-Fi um, enabled chipsets to move measurements back and forth and for position uh, uh, estimates to be calculated. They allow uh, access points to um, locate each other via some relative scheme of everyone hearing each other, so some relative um, uh, time of arrival and, and signal strength measurements. So if you don't know, if you know where one access point is but you don't know where the other access points are, you can kind of uh, learn what they are. And then they even have a, a, a standard for two disparate service providers sharing Wi-Fi uh, data access points. So uh, the Korean government is very serious about getting indoor positioning to work, partially for emergency services. The Korean operators are deploying access points in a very controlled fashion. So they are, uh, the carriers know where they are. They have a, a, a good base station almanac of them and there's open interfaces to enable all of this. It's a great model. Um, if the industry as a whole could somehow uh, model after it, I think you know, we could have a, a workable solution. And, and as I said earlier, OMA is starting to do a little work here um, if you factor in some of the uh, IETF specs that are out there as well. Uh, there's some other stuff here I'll go over really quickly. Uh, W3C, this is more at the application level side. This is where stuff like HTML5 is starting to be uh, defined in terms of location-based uh, uh, functionality. And then there's some historical um, um, uh, APIs in place today that you'll find in your browser and you know, are the foundation of the user experience uh, for location-based applications. Things like device orientation are standardized. Um, um, they're just starting uh, to get into new areas of work like uh, reverse geocoding and stuff like that. It's not done yet, but certainly areas um, we should pay attention to and, and, and fold into the, uh, the master strategy if we have one. Um, Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, once again, just more uh, information on the application side. So there's markup languages to uh, uh, define navigation routes to make applications easier to use. Uh, probably not all helpful on the emergency services side in terms of the 911, but maybe helpful in terms of the Department of the Defense type presentation we just saw. Uh, and then femtoform, this is kind of um, um, related to my first comment about 3GBP and 3GBP2. I think femto cells are an area where the industry's not being aggressive enough, and I think that's because the focus is on wireless LAN, because obviously there's a huge difference in terms of the penetration rate, uh, and then that's the usability of it. Uh, but the Femto Forum, of course, is a industry organization meant to foster success of Femto cells. So, you know, they are uh, uh, actively working on location-related um, technology. And in fact, they have something uh, uh, very similar to 802.11v, where some controlling uh, management center can control all the Femto cells uh, and make measurements of mobiles in the room and determine uh, the location of the device. So you know, managed femtocell deployments are coming with some kind of network-centric, network-based positioning server and there's standards in place for that. That same model could be used in wireless LAN and maybe wireless LAN and femtocells converge in terms of their um, uh, form factor and deployment. So, um, so now I'll go into a little more detail on a few of the standards bodies I just went over. Most of my focus will be on OMA because I really think that's where uh, uh, the best solution is forming in terms of the industry. So, um, you know, SUPL 3.0 is just a numbering system, right? SUPL 1 enabled basic services over 
2G and 3G. SUPL2 enabled more advanced services over uh, 4G, uh, geofences and tracking type applications, but it was still just using the underlying control plane positioning technologies of assisted GNSS and <coughs> AFLT and LTDA. Um, so SUPL 3.0 is a framework that allows uh, more things to happen and in particular it allows the um, uh, LTE positioning protocol extensions to be executed. So LPP, the LTE positioning protocol is the AGNSS and OTDA positioning protocol defined by 3GBP for LTE phones, but it's a control plane solution. Um, and 3GBP can control G, uh, GSM, they can control wideband CDMA, they can control LTE, but they can't control Wi-Fi, the air interface of Wi-Fi and how it, how it works. So they created, uh, when they wrote LPP, they wrote it extensible and they said, somebody please fill in the blanks in terms of the wireless LAN or any other type uh, of measurement. So you could think of WiMAX, uh, UMB, a lot of different technologies were thrown in at the start, but obviously wireless LAN is the, is the crown jewel of what LPPE is working on. Um, so LPPE um, um, is where um, uh, uh, a lot of this is going on and the 802.11b measurements are uh, able to be passed in uh, um, LPPE. You can actually move um, information about the uh, location of the transmitters back and forth, so downloading tiles, that type of technology is already effectively in the OMA standard. So a lot of the services and technologies you see today, you could morph into a, a fully standards-based solution uh, if you wanted to, and what's missing still needs to be standardized. Um, there's something called the discovered SLP, which is a key part of the solution as well. And the next figure, I think, will help us see this. So, um, so SEPL is based on, you know, it's IP-based service, so it's called the user plane. So your phone, goes to your home uh, SLP, SUPL location platform. And so if you have a um, you know, phone from a, a carrier that's deployed SUPL, um, this is where you get your location-based services. And location-based services are, once again, based on the outdoor positioning technologies of AGNSS and AFLT, uh, and they're based on wireless WAN base station almanacs, knowing where the transmitters uh, at the wireless WAN level are. And you communicate with that and you, you can get a position estimate. Um, but it's easy for a carrier to keep track of their, you know, 100,000 base stations or 200,000 base stations. Um, but for the access points, there's much more. And there was a lot of talk about uh, privacy issues, ownership issues, venue specific issues. So this discovered uh, SLP in the OMA context is a great framework to allow the DSLP to be venue specific. So the home SLP um, can tell you about the DSLP or you can discover the DSLP through some other uh, mechanisms. In fact, uh, 802.11u is a, a, a service discovery mechanism in IEEE that could be used. Um, and then so once you discover the DSLP, this could be the, um, inter, uh, interact, the server that you interact with to get information about the, where the access points are, um, uh, to pass back RSSI and RTT type measurements. Uh, so the framework is all in place. We think it's, um, uh, um, uh, it, it enables this outdoor to indoor transition, purely standards based. Um, so we're, we're, we're big believers in, in this and, you know, I would like to funnel uh, activity that way. Um, so um, then uh, that's it on OMA. And then uh, I think I've pretty much already talked about this in the introductory stuff, but this is just some details about uh, what's in 802.11b. And like I said, I think the problem with 802.11b is it's a layer two mechanism. Um, you know, you could get um, uh, chipset vendors and access point vendors to interoperate and you'd have this basic capability, but it's, it would only work for managed access points and it would only work on wireless LAN. It doesn't have a seamless integration with wireless WAN. Um, it allows for, you know, uh, civic uh, and geospatial formats to go back and forth. So, you know, it's, a, it's actually, you know, a very old spec and the foundation of some of the current work that's going on. Um, yeah, I think I'll skip over this. I don't think there's uh, just, it's a reference for you in terms of what's in there. I just wanted to give some content if we wanted to get into the details. Um, so the IETF, the IETF is another uh, a standards body I'll, I'll delve into a little bit. 
Um, so there was some talk about um, GeoPriv earlier today. Uh, it's definitely the working group where uh, this type of uh, activity uh, could take place. Um, it's uh, GeoPriv because it does both geo geospatial stuff like actual measurements and positioning a technology and it also uh, focuses a lot of its time and energy on privacy. Uh, OMA is not so interested in privacy so there could be a good partnership here between the IETF and OMA. Um, but you can see a lot of the stuff that they've done over the time. Some of it's redundant. Um, the actual position determination uh, capabilities, the um, uh, the ability to move assistance data back and forth, to move measurements back and forth, I think is redundant with the other standards. So this is uh, an, uh, uh, an example of how um, the industry's kind of got disparate efforts and, 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 and it, it's causing a little bit of confusion. I'll list a couple standards uh, on this page and the next on what they're working on. So uh, this RFC 5139 is actually a, a, an important one because it does do all the um, uh, formats for um, the actual locations, so this pit of flow uh, information. That's actually what's in 3GBP. So 3GBP borrowed uh, this spec. OMA borrowed this spec. If you look at uh, 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 voice over IP, IMSE 911 call flows that we'll see uh, in the U.S. here sometime in the future, you know, the positions moving around are going to be based on the IETF standard. Uh, they can give you just a, a geographical descriptor like an X and a Y, and an R for certain, you know, two-dimensional two or three-dimensional, but it can also give you specific, uh, you know, uh, indoor location estimates. If you had an underlying indoor location technology and if you dialed 911 from your cubicle and there was some way to identify your cubicle, you could pass that uh, specific information about your cubicle up in, 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 in this standardized format. Um, three other uh, standards that they're working on. Um, uh, the second one there is just an extension of RFC 5139, um, just more information. Um, uh, it actually describes types of buildings. They had some uh, uh, registry for types of uh, 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 what they defined as structures like an airplane or, or a bus or whatever. So you can actually say you're in seat 11E or something if you're dialing 911 from an airplane. Um, uh, and then these last two are examples are where I think they're somewhat redundant. So the, this held measurement one basically copied 802.11b, copied the AGNSS and uh, AFLT and OTDA standards and allowed these measurements to be moved at the IP layer. Uh, so we certainly want to funnel all of these activities into some common efforts. Um, and then uh, just uh, as a wrap up, um, so once again, 3GPP and 3GPP2 have done a great job with satellite-based systems and terrestrial-based systems, um, but they wrote it in the concept, uh, context of cellular providers and mobile phones, and they didn't really have stated goals for indoors or outdoors. They didn't talk about indoors or outdoors. They basically said, hey, you can get, if you can make a cell phone call, you can get a position estimate, and the position estimate will be labeled with some uncertainty, and it works. So anywhere where you can dial 911, you can also get a position estimate. So it works everywhere that you can make a phone call. So in that sense, they weren't worried about indoors or outdoors. They weren't worried about the FCC mandate. It's the international standards bodies. Some, company, uh, some countries don't have mandates. So they basically just defined a complete solution, but without specific targets, let's say, on, on accuracy or the ability to represent indoor locations. Everything was in the XYZ format. Um, as I mentioned, I think, um, you know, they've neglected the opportunity of the femtocell integration and the wireless LAN integration to go, go further. It's not too late to, to undo that, but, uh, you know, it requires member companies to drive this. And, you know, Qualcomm's just one member company. And, 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 and in particular, the carriers would have to really drive this kind of activity, I think. So no pressure, FD. So, um, um, and then, um, you know, uh, my main theme I think today is that if you look across the standards, it's, it's somewhat of a disjoint effort and, you know, since there's a lack of a master plan and a lot of uh, technology vendors go um, standards body shopping, right? If you can't get what, uh, achieve what you want achieved in OMA, then you go to uh, the FCC and I didn't list a bunch of other ones. You can go to NINA, you can go to the IETF, you can go to IEEE, you can go to um, uh, you can create femto forms or the broadband forms and this is where you can push your technology through and you know it's important from a business perspective but it certainly 
doesn't necessarily lead to a, a cohesive, uh, non-fragmented ecosystem, and I think that's what we really need. Um, OMA, as I, I've said a few times already, I think is the best place to, uh, to keep everything centralized and, and to avoid the, the fragmentation here. Obviously, it's going to depend on IETF, it's going to depend on IEEE, it's going to depend on 3GBP and 3GBP2 for other uh, activities. So at the end of the day, they all need to coordinate. Uh, and, that's, and that's the, uh, the main point of the message today. So that's my presentation. Thank you.